the second video in our short, short series about the different types of swords used during the Eighty Years' War in the Netherlands. This also bleeds over uh, into the Thirty Years' War. Our first video covered uh, the swords used in the first half of the war, uh, till 1600. And this video is going to cover the second half of the war, starting at 1600 till about uh, 1648. In the second half of the war there was a lot more standardization when it came to bladed weapons. Uh, this mostly due to the reorganization of the standing army by uh, Prince Maurits van Oranje Nassau. There was still a lot of variation, but it made it easier to classify the different types. Between 1596 and 1599, regulations were established uh, for the military that dictated their uh, weaponry and pay. For instance, uh, a cavalryman uh, had to be equipped with a short sword, uh, capable of both the cut and the thrust. And an infantryman uh, should be equipped with a rapier, which in this case means uh, a, long, a longer sword uh, that's sufficient at the thrust. In the last video I covered uh, Germanic rapiers. Uh, these could be can also be considered uh, Veldegens, uh, but according to the regulations in this period, uh, most of the 16th century examples would have been a, a bit too short for the infantry. According to Dutch uh, edge weapon historian, uh, Jan Piet Puipen, uh, the end of the 16th and beginning of the 17th century shows the first uh, development of a typical Dutch uh, sword hilt design. This is shown in the images uh, by Jacob de Gein. These images show uh, fashionably dressed officers armed with field swords. Some have rapier hilts. Others have hilts that resemble the Germanic rapier, but with their own particular style often without protection in front of the ricasso, so you can't grip it in the same way as you, should, as you would a rapier. According to Puypen, this is the first typical Dutch sword hilt design. According to what we see in art, most soldiers were not trained to hold their swords uh, in the typical rapier grip, even if uh, it had a rapier style hilt. Most common we see them hold their swords in either a hammer grip or a handshake grip and they don't wrap their fingers around the ricasso even if, it's, if it will be safe to do so. Different styles of Veldegens or field swords do remain popular in the first half of the 17th century. A straight double-edged sword with two rings coming out of the guard, which, resem which slightly resembles uh, the two claws of a crab. Uh, because of these rings, uh, the sword can be held in a rapier grip, but the blade is a lot wider than that of rapier, and it's, and it's shorter. Uh, it could be considered uh, a side sword. These swords do resemble Iberian swords from the 15th and 16th century. It's often stated that uh, these swords were used by Rondasiers, uh, infantry soldiers armed with a shield and a sword. I haven't found much sources to justify this claim, apart from Adam Brehm whose work was experimental and not, never actually used on the battlefield. And in this work he also lists uh, the sword as a rapier. Scheepshouwers, or cutlasses in English, are a particular type of houdegen used within a naval context. The, uh, they can be straight or curved. Many of the Dutch examples have a shell-shaped guard on the side to protect the hand, and some also have a thumb ring on the other side. Dutch edge weapons historian Jan Puypen uh, claims that many of these swords uh, originated as cavalry swords in the 16th century, and they were, used on, were repurposed on ships uh, from about 1600. And this style of sword was used on Dutch ships uh, into the 19th century. From about 1610, a new sword design starts popping up that uh, historians categorize as uh, the evolution of the earlier field swords. They uh, have a relatively simple hilt, and they are straight-bladed and double-edged. 
Um, they have some of the elements that we later see on balloon hills, like perforated plates on the sides of the of the guard. They can have uh, yeah, they can have side rings, plates, perforated plates, and uh, thumb rings and knuckle bows. And these swords were used far into the 17th century by both cavalry and infantry. The balloon-hilted sword is often thought to have originated in Wallonia, which is now the southern half of Belgium. But most historians now agree that uh, the sword originates in the Netherlands. These swords uh, are often straight-bladed, but not always. There are, there are curved examples. Uh, the straight bladed ones are often uh, double edged. They often have a knuckle bow uh, perforated plates, but these plates can also be solid. And uh, thumb rings are also not uncommon. The earliest example I could find was from 1612, but they really become popular between 1630 and 1650. And they remain uh, popular in the military uh, well into the 18th century. From about 1620, lighter, more elegant swords uh, start to become popular. Some of these could, could be considered as transitional rapiers. But rather quickly, uh, a few different styles start to emerge. The hilts of these swords can have protective rings or plates, and many of them don't feature knuckle bows. They are often shorter than typical rapiers and often do not have protection in front of the ricasso, so it can't be gripped in a typical rapier grip. Industry swords are often called bundledegens. In English, uh, this, this would mean walking or strolling swords. In English, these swords can also be classified as small swords, dress swords, or pillow swords. These swords are often used by high status individuals who didn't want to carry a, a full rapier, a rapier with them but their station uh, in society still demanded of them to carry a sword when they were out in the open. Okay, if you have any questions, please leave it in the comments. Also, did I forget any sword uh, within the list I gave? Uh, was there any sword that still needs to be added? Was there any information I got wrong or any information that you think that I missed? Please also leave that in the comments. And uh, if you like this video, please show it some engagement, uh, subscribe or give it a like, or uh, share this with people who might be interested because we really would like to see this channel grow a little bit and uh, see our information get out into the world. Thank you.